Good day, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Today's session is the MIPI A5 webinar, the cornerstone of a MIPI automotive system solution. So today's webinar is presented by Ariel Lazri, director of the MIPI Alliance Board of Directors and chief engineer at Toshiba Electronics Europe. Also presenting is Ido Cohen, the MIPI A5 subgroup vice lead and director of strategic innovation at Valens Semiconductor. A few things to note as we start the session today. All of the telephone lines have been muted upon entry. The session will be recorded and made available on the MIPI Alliance website in the Knowledge Library, and that will be available by the end of the business day today. The session will be approximately 60 minutes in total. The presentation will be 45 or 50 minutes, and then we'll open up for Q&A session. During the Q&A, you can ask questions by either raising your hand, and I can unmute your line if you wish to ask a verbal question. Otherwise, feel free to type your questions in either the chat or the Q&A window. And with that, I'd like to introduce Peter Lefkin, Managing Director of MIPI Alliance, and he will provide a brief introduction. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Dervla, and thanks everybody for joining today's call. There's been a lot of interest in MIPI AFI, and, and we wanted to brief the, the ecosystem on recent announcements as well as uh, give a, a bit more information than has uh, traditionally been provided on, on AFI to the public. Um, you can see the agenda here. Uh, Ariel Lassery will give the system view, and Ido Cohen will give a, a detailed spec overview. I'll give just a brief two-slide update on, on MIPI Alliance um, and leave the rest of the time to Ariel and Ido. Um, just starting out, so uh, my name is Peter Lefkin. I'm Managing Director of MIPI Alliance, and um, MIPI Alliance has been you know, in existence since 2003. Uh, in the left-hand corner, you can see some archaic uh, phones. Uh, and MIPI's reason, for, initial reason for being was really to standardize camera and display interfaces in a mobile device. Um, and that specification that was developed uh, back in 2003, 2004, you know, really uh, gave the MIPI Alliance the foundation within mobile and also has extended uh, MIPI's member ecosystem beyond that, which I'll cover in a second. Uh, fast forward uh, 17 years or so, to today, uh, there's at least one MIPI specification in every smartphone uh, on the market today, and we've developed over 50 uh, specifications covering a, a range of uh, interface applications needed for mobile devices. And I think one of the success factors for MIPI has been its, its attention and, and primary focus on mobile. And as the mobile ecosystem and industry has evolved uh, rapidly and, and changed tremendously over those uh, 17 years. The alliance really, uh, the specifications that are fit for purpose for mobile have also extended uh, beyond the reach of mobile. Um, you can see that our member ecosystem has evolved over time as well. We're in 27 countries. 45% of our members are active in the automotive sector and, and those are you know, of the 332 members. Uh, the growing list of the member ecosystem really started with the application processor developers, device OEMs, and semiconductor companies. And as MIPI Alliance expanded, uh, the, the specifications got adopted and implemented in products. The full ecosystem really started to grow uh, to include test equipment companies, test labs, uh, VIP and IP providers, the range of uh, consumer electronics companies in mobile and, and beyond mobile, and also software providers. And we have a number of automotive OEMs and tier one suppliers that are, are joining and evaluate, evaluating joining as well. Um, you know, MIPI and automotive is not necessarily aspirational. Um, there are cameras and, and displays in, in, uh, with the MIPI specifications in automotive today. Um, and we'll detail a little bit of that uh, in addition to what we're doing to make them more efficient and effective. Um, I mentioned Beyond Mobile. Uh, you can see on the left-hand slide side, there's uh, you know automotive, industrial, heads-up displays, wearables, uh, avionics, medical, and IoT. You know, all of, I get, we get surprised uh, by the types of companies that join MIPI and also the varied applications and, and implementation of MIPI specifications in the market. I think one of the success factors as well was MIPI's early 
uh, adoption within mobile of uh, royalty free uh, specifications and adoption and implementation for MIPI members. Uh, and we adjusted that to extend to non mobile applications as well and implementations. So uh, MIPI specifications adopted, let's say in automotive, are essentially you know, royalty free for implementation uh, you know, by MIPI members. You can see on the right side, uh, I won't go through all of those, nor will we have time to necessarily go through all of them today, but you can see the range of specifications in automotive from camera to display uh, to the two physical layers, CFI and DFI, and the third AFI that you know, Ariel and Ida will, will go into a bit of detail on today's call. Uh, I3C for sensor and, and control interface uh, within a module, RFFE for antenna tuning, uh, audio uh, in Soundwire and Swiss, and then we've also partnered with JEDEC um, on UFS for, uh, and that universal flash storage, and that includes MIPI's Unipro and M5 standards. Uh, with that, I definitely just wanted to give a brief uh, overview of MIPI and kind of current status uh, in a very short period. And I do want to hand it over to Ariel Lossary, who will take over uh, the presentation from here and give a, a system view on MIPI A5. Thanks, everybody, again for joining. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Ariel Lassery. Uh, I am uh, uh, working for Toshiba in Europe, and I'm uh, participating in the A5 uh, specification. Um, um, so let me introduce you a system view for the A5. Huh? Um, okay. So the automotive industry is in the process of uh, major transformations driven by multiple factors that should result with safer cars, with less fatalities, and hopefully also to less CO2 reduction. Uh, this can be summarized by the CASE acronym for Connected, Automated, Shared, and Electrified. Connected with the telematic unit moving to 5G, connecting the car to cloud services. It's, this is something which is similar to what is happening in other industries. The car is becoming then an IoT object. Automated, with the vision of robot cars and the move to level three and automated driving. We're still not there yet. Uh, maybe we are at level two or level two and a half uh, uh, today, but uh, this is uh, the long-term goal. Um, the shared economy is being applied also to vehicles with the emergence of uh, new players and uh, new business models. Electrification with hybrid and electrical vehicles, where battery, charging technologies, and new materials are becoming important topics. Uh, MIPI is supporting the case with uh, standard specifications such as the RF fronted for connected uh, case, uh, A5, CSI2, and more for the automated uh, case here. And not to forget safety, which is very important. We've improved the safety regulation. The levels of uh, driving automation are well known. I'm not going to every detail of this slide from level zero to with no automation up to level five with the full automation. And to enable such automation, you can imagine many sensors are required and they are spread all over the car. And MIPI CSI2 and the AFI are important contributors to enable the reliable and uh, efficient transport of uh, sensor data. New car assessment programs and regulation are driving the need for sensors and display adoption in a car. For example, in uh, uh, advanced driver assistance system, uh, advanced driver assistance system surround view application is driving the need for multiple high data rate sensors. Then the information needs to be displayed for the driver after being processed by the ECU. Uh, this is also driving requirement for display adoption. And one of the central challenges in autonomous driving system is the transport of raw sensor data. Oh, sorry. One of the central challenges in the autonomous driving system is the uh, transport of raw sensor data from the uh, camera image sensors, LIDAR and radar, to the sensor fusion ECU. Here are a few examples of the required link speed. Huh? So when talking about a camera use case, if we had 
10 gigabit per second. One use case could be to have um, 10 megapixel camera sensor with 16 uh, bit raw data and one exposure channel at 16 frames per second. Or another use case is a two megapixel sensor also with row 16, but with uh, four exposure channels at 60 frames per second. For radar uh, with a 12 and a half gig uh, link, we could support four typical RX channel with 50 mega sample at uh, 12 bit resolution, or a maximum RX uh, channel with 80 mega samples per second and 16 bit resolution. And uh, not to forget the display for display subsystem, a 16 gigabit link uh, is required if you want to support a 4K display panels uh, at uh, 60 Hertz. So what is AFI? Uh, AFI is an asymmetric physical layer specification targeted for automotive service for use in uh, ADA system, autonomous driving system, and infotainment system. The version 1.0 supports data rate from 2 to 16 gigabit per second over 15 meter reach. And the MIPI has a roadmap to support uh, 24 and 48 gigabit and even beyond. So as Peter mentioned, uh, the MIPI CSI2 and uh, camera specification and DSI, DSI2 uh, are well proven protocol and widely uh, deployed in mobile applications as well as beyond mobile in over a billion of devices. And these protocols are also uh, popular in automotive. But since these protocols are using files that have been optimized for use in mobile application with CFI, DFI, where the low power and low EMI are the driving requirement, such files have a typical reach of about 30 centimeter. This is not enough for automotive. In automotive, a longer reach of up to 15 meter is required. Furthermore, the automotive environment is pretty much different than mobile. The automotive applications have much more stringent requirements for EMC, robustness, reliability, and functional safety point of view. So in order to be able to reuse the well-proven uh, MIPI mobile protocol and the wide availability of devices implementing these interfaces, several proprietary service solutions addressing the issue of the longer reach in automotive channel have been established and are currently widely in use in today's car. So each uh, camera module, ECU, and display are, con are built in uh, separate uh, boxes or modules and all connected by automotive cable. Each of these uh, modules can come from uh, different tier one suppliers. And to ensure the interoperability when using such uh, proprietary uh, service interface, both sides of the link must use the service from the same single source single supplier. Now, with the increased number of links in the car, the industry cannot afford a single source proprietary solution anymore. More flexibility is required, and a standard solution is also required. And that is what MIPI uh, is trying to accomplish with uh, AFI. So in the first deployment stage, it is expected that uh, standard AFI bridges are used for camera and displays. And this will open the door for multiple suppliers to provide interoperable devices based on the standard technology, the MIPI AFI. In a second stage, the AFI could be integrated directly into the camera sensors and also into SOC and uh, display module, eliminating the need for a service bridge. And by that, bringing further down the bill of materials costs. So in addition to the MIPI CSI and DSI protocol, uh, AFI supports also VESA display port and uh, EDP, uh, for which uh, MIPI is developing an adaptation layer. So MIPI AFI is the only standard interface to support native camera and display interface for automotive using CSI2 and DSI2 over AFI. Any other solution would require a bridge. So, Let's talk about topology. So AFI basically is a point-to-point to -point topology link, but it can also support other topology such as uh, hubs and uh, daisy chaining of devices. On the left side, you have an example of uh, a camera with surround view application where multiple sensors can be connected directly to the ECU. Each of them has uh, its own cable. Then it's all coming to the ECU where you have uh, AFI, uh, uh, aggregator that takes all the camera, four camera links, 
to create a single CSI2 stream to the SOC. Huh? So this is one example. Another example, for example, on the display side, on the right side, um, where we have a single uh, cable coming from the uh, ECU, uh, but this cable is used to aggregate multiple display streams over uh, a single A5. And the streams are being uh, separated in the first node, which is here in this case the main user display module, and forwarded to the appropriate display module that are connected in a daisy chain uh, fashion. Uh, this is useful when modules are close to each other and less cable harness uh, is needed to connect all the display devices. And by that, contributing also to the overall cable harness and weight reduction in a car. So when looking at such uh, topologies, it is necessary to consider functional safety, security, and content protection, not only on each single link base, but from end to end. So the challenges uh, to be solved um, are requiring AFI and the MIPI protocol. So if you take, uh, for example, uh, this uh, rear view camera application, where the camera information are transported to the ECU or the cable, and from there, after processing, it needs to be uh, displayed for the driver. The driver can see if it can safely drive uh, with the reverse gear to the back and then could recognize, oh, there is a child behind the car, so better to stop now. So from safety perspective, it is extremely important that the image with the child, which is behind, arrives unmodified to the display of the driver. Otherwise, it could be very fatal. Yeah? So if for whatever reason the display was frozen or the image sensor was frozen, the driver could not recognize that there is somebody behind the car and this will be fatal result. So therefore, from functional safety point of view, it is important to have an end-to-end -end protection, and such end-to-end -end protection cannot be realized only by the AFI itself. It involves the AFI and the associated protocol like CSI2 and DSI2 to make sure we have a true end-to-end -end, uh, protection. Therefore, MIPI has followed the guideline of uh, ISO 26262 and applied them uh, not only to the AFI, but to the whole protocol stack from the top down to the file level. But that's not the only challenge to be solved. Also, oh, it is necessary to have a very robust link that is suitable for long reach automotive use cases. And we were talking about 15 meters with all the stringent uh, requirements in terms of reliability, car noise, and EMC. And well, with the AFI, it features a reliable link with extremely low packet error rate with 10 to the minus 18. This means that the packet error can occur approximately every 10,000 car lifetime, if I count 10 links in average per car, which is extremely rare. Um, so we, as we were talking about the image, it requires a high-speed uh, downlink uh, to support aggregation of multiple 4K camera and uh, display. And at the same time, we need to keep uh, low latency. And when operating at uh, gear five, we can reach uh, six microsecond uh, latency at max. So as I mentioned, the functional safety uh, need to be uh, done end to end. And the AFI with the associated protocol enable the system integration of MIPI devices in AZLB and AZLD system, depending on the required functional safety goals of each specific application. Similarly, for the security, end-to-end -end protection is required. So it does not help to have a reliable link between the camera and the ECU uh, because it's um, connected by a cable. If somebody, malicious person, could insert something in between to tamper the image from the camera uh, or tamper the image going to the display, uh, then it could be fatal. Another important requirement is to enable uh, such high level of end-to-end uh, functional safety security uh, when using heterogeneous uh, interfaces. For example, when I'm using different display protocol uh, on a different side of the link, like uh, MIPI DSI uh, or VESA DisplayPort, EDP, or even OpenLDI. Yeah? Or if I'm using different type of file, 
uh, on the camera or on the uh, SOC side, like uh, CFI, DeFi, uh, and so on. So all of these requirements make it uh, uh, necessary to have a well-optimized and aligned specification between the file and the protocol layers for camera and display at the system level. The end-to-end -end protection is realized always source to sync, from the camera source pixel to the sync with the CSI2, and from the display source to the display uh, panel with DSI. MIPI is supporting both MIPI uh, display and VESA display over AFI, and HDCP is uh, added for content protection uh, as needed. And MIPI take care also for the control path, which is also very important with the command set specification, like for example, the camera command set or the display command set, which enable the use of common Linux driver for efficient and fast uh, system integration. And also uh, MIPI is taking care for um, for sideband uh, uh, signaling with uh, I2C, I3C, and uh, GPIO. So it's all collection of uh, specification, which is there. So how does it all fit in a clean protocol layer stack is uh, illustrated in the diagram here. Well, you can recognize that the lower layer, the MIPI A5 with the uh, two la sub-layer, the A5, the A5 Phi sub layer and the data link sub layer, which is agnostic to each protocol. Ido will provide uh, more detail later. And the protocol are connected to the AFI via protocol adaptation layer. And MIP is developing the protocol adaptation layers for optimal use for the Phi for each dedicated protocol while taking care also for the functional safety as needed. And MIP is using a common approach for the AFI protocol uh, adaptation layer um, for display and uh, camera and also between display in order to enable heterogeneous system, as I explained uh, before. And not to forget the low bandwidth interface I was talking uh, before. So with that, I will hand over to Ido uh, to give more detail on the AFI. Thank you, Ariel. Um, just uh, I'll introduce myself very quickly. I'm Ido. I'm, uh, the A5 subgroup uh, vice lead uh, in MIPI, and I'm also the uh, uh, director of strategic Info innovation in Xeon semiconductors. Uh, <clears throat> so, and I will try to go in a little bit more details uh, on the highlights of the A5. So, <clears throat> so first, um, this is the the table of the rates and uh, uh, modulation schemes for, uh, for the AFI. The AFI has one rate or modulation per downlink gear, and it has single uplink gear uh, for, that uh, uh, goes with all the, that, the downlink gears. So <clears throat> you can see that uh, there are, as Ariel mentioned earlier, there are gears, five gears, from 2 gigabit per second to 16 gigabit per second, gear 1 to 5, uh, where the two lower gears are implemented as uh, NRZ 8 bit, 10 bit, uh, running at uh, 2, 2 gigabout and 4 gigabout. And gear 3 to 4 are using PAM, uh, PAM 4, PAM 8, and PAM 16 accordingly, and all using maintaining the symbol rate of 4 gigabit, 4 gigabout in order to maintain low, uh, low baud rate, uh, especially for uh, better uh, uh, noise immunity and uh, better uh, uh, utilization of existing cables. Um, <clears throat> also, you can see that um, the, uh, the net application data rate for each of these uh, downlink uh, rates, and you can see that uh, for the uh, gear one and two for the NRZ, it is 75% uh, of the data of the uh, gear data rate. And for uh, gear three to five, these are 90% of the data rate of the file. Um, the the uh, gears one and two are um, uh, Profile one, what we call profile one, we have two profile noises. 
that uh, allow uh, uh, noise immunity in two levels. One is profile one, which is uh, the NRZ is more, more aiming at optimizing for low cost and power implementation uh, at the lower gears, and it gives uh, a lower noise immunity levels that we will look at in, in, the, in the following slides for bit error rate of 10 by minus 12. The uh, gears from three to five are uh, optimized for the lifespan of the vehicle uh, for long term, and they uh, have much, much better noise immunity, and they allow for packet error rate of 10 by minus 19 um, uh, with the with the 90% net data rate. Um, each uh, each of these. A, a gears, each implementation gear, for example, a gear five needs to support all the gears down to gear one in order to maintain interoperability and web backward compatibility. So any device can work with a uh, lower gear device, and this is uh, in, inherent in the five design that we will go uh, to look at uh, in the coming slides. So from high level structure, uh, the phi is, uh, is defined between the data link layer with two la sub layers, data link layer and phi layer, uh, which is connected to a uh, native protocol, which is like CSI2 or DSI2 or low speed interfaces like, like I2C and GPIO. Then they hit, we have the protocol adaptation layer, PAL, which is mapping the native protocol into an A packet uh, over an APPI, which is the interface between, the, between uh, any file to the link layer, data link layer. <laughs> the data link layer is taking the A packet and actually making all the uh, necessary prioritization, scheduling, and forwarding uh, of the packet uh, and arrange it to the specific file layers. And in the file layer, there are uh, multiple blocks for uh, doing the encode and decode of the symbols and um, handling the packets uh, to the uh, physical layer, physical uh, 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 layer, okay. <clears throat> So, as, as we said, this is the A packet. The A packet is a, um, structured uh, to carry, a, it is agnostic, a, then the link layer is agnostic, the data link layer is agnostic to any a native protocol and such the data, the A packet is structured to be able to accommodate any of these protocols and it uh, carries uh, all the required information uh, for the data link layer to uh, perform the function, the, the, need, the needed functions efficiently. The same packets are used for both uplink and downlink uh, to maintain simplicity uh, uh, of the implementation. <clears throat> the structure uh, selected with the relatively low overhead of header and tail is uh, optimized for supporting the uh, protocol aggregation uh, uh, on, the, on a single AFI uh, uh, interface, such as uh, 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 aggregating the low speed and high speed, or maybe even multi-streams of the same high speed. Uh, so uh, this is uh, defined as part of the uh, A packet structure. We have the eight, bit, eight byte header, that includes a message counter, eight bit message counter with uh, multiple other uh, capabilities, including CRC and a CRC a tail of CRC32. Um, the CRC32 and the message counter are part of the uh, uh, provisioning that the AFI is uh, giving implementers to support uh, the ISO 26262. 
and uh, allow for a, a high level of uh, functional safety capabilities. <clears throat> Just a quick uh, a description of the interconnect of the two AFIs. And this is just to uh, indicate that AFI was uh, designed uh, to support both coax and uh, SDP cable types, and to support also the capability of power over cable support and accommodate uh, the noise elements that are uh, uh, associated with it. Uh, it supports cables up to 15 meters with uh, four inline connectors. Um, and this is just a basic scheme of understanding the general uh, uh, connectivity. Uh, for, for example, this is a A5 source, like a camera, uh, and this is the A5 sync, uh, which is the ECU. Uh, the power supply is on the side of the ECU, and uh, the power device is on the side of the camera. Data stream is going from camera, or the main data data stream is going from the camera to the ECU, and that's uh, that's that's the basic uh, connectivity. As I said, the uh, the AFI is uh, uh, designed from uh, perspective of future looking and. Uh, making sure that there is a, a noise immunity and a low uh, interferences. So um, as you can see, it is optimized for low PSD by using low TX amplitude for the downlink. You can see these are the levels of uh, millivolts uh, peak to peak of each of the gears. And if comparing uh, four gigabit uh, uh, downlink TX voltages, for other uh, uh, published uh, solution. So you can see that for uh, the uh, MIPI it's uh, 350 millivolts peak to peak, while others are uh, about 500 millivolts peak to peak. And from PSD uh, perspective, this is a, a, an advantage and uh, uh, making sure that uh, in overall design, AFI is not uh, uh, making any noises to other uh, devices and meeting PSD limits of uh, multiple OEM vendors. Uh, these numbers are, of course, for the coax channel. Uh, and um, similar, you can uh, extrapolate for the differential, uh, uh, the differential cable. Um, <clears throat> noise immunity. So, um, noise immunity was one of the major topics when uh, going uh, to design the AFI. And the AFI subgroup were, were, were working very hard to understand the overall requirements. And we found out that there is a major variance in the EMC requirements from the different OEM, where some of them are aiming for a minimal noise immunity while others are, have very stringent requirements uh, to protect their systems. Mm -hmm. This is the reason that uh, we have uh, uh, generated the two profile uh, 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 noise immunity levels in order to be able to accommodate this variance. So profile one, P1, is, uh, has lower noise immunity, similar to other uh, uh, solutions. And this is applicable for gear one and two, which is two gigabit per second and four gigabit per second. And it's optional for gear three. And profile two is a very high noise immunity uh, based on a, a extensive analysis done by MIPI Alliances, MIPI Alliance uh, in, in, in cooperation with external labs and uh, with the participation of many companies within the group. Uh, so it can meet the expected noise level of the car lifetime period. Uh, <clears throat> MIPI conducted uh, multiple tests in independent labs evaluating the noise levels. 
and chilling effect uh, degradation after mechanical and stress and aging. So in order to be able to evaluate the different technologies uh, when we uh, worked on the def defining the AFI and also uh, to reach a, the best uh, solution possible. The, the AFI subgroup continues this uh, research in order to make sure that we uh, continually uh, improving these uh, uh, definitions uh, to accommodate uh, uh, the noise immunity that we are seeking. So just to, clear, just to give a background on this uh, test, so you can see the amount of uh, the type of testing that were done. Uh, they were done in, a, in the dependent lab. We've done a, this uh, two meter cable and 15 meter cable with different type of a, a configuration, different kind of cables and the connector types. Uh, band, uh, we tested bundles with uh, some kind of uh, special PCBs and dedicated PCBs or and PCBs that are emulating uh, usage of uh, uh, actual uh, implementations of ECUs uh, in order to uh, go to, to get our conclusions. Uh, this is an example of one of the uh, uh, stress test and the uh, aging testing that, we, that was done to the cables. And these are the uh, interesting results that we got. You can see that uh, in some cases there is a major difference between uh, before be be between the aging or the stress test and the uh, after it. So this was very uh, uh, interesting uh, testing, and it led us to uh, <clears throat> to, to the uh, implementation. Or that will be able to accommodate such differences between uh, the uh, new cables and the lifespan of the cable. So um, these are the type of noise, noise immunity levels that is uh, uh, accommodated by the different profiles in uh, in uh, the in the. Uh, uh, MIPI, MIPI A5. Um, you can see the major differences between the profile two and profile one uh, for the RF ingress, uh, for the for the BCI bulk current injection, and the first transient test that uh, were done. So you can see that um, the levels for profile two are very high. Um, these levels were defined for the receiver pads. Uh, of uh, 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 of a specific receiver with the assume, assumption of the typical worst case cable and channel. Um, the 40 millivolt peak to peak, the uh, 40 millivolt peak is corresponding to 89 dB microvolt RMS. If uh, just someone needs uh, a reference and. <clears throat> whoever has access to IEEE uh, papers. So actually there is, another, uh, there is a paper in the IEEE done by a, an independent uh, different group uh, checking similar noise limits and uh, reached very similar numbers to the numbers uh, the MEPA for some group reached. So I encourage anybody that has access to go and seek this, uh, doc this uh, paper. As Ariel mentioned, functional safety was also one of the main goals in making sure that uh, AFI, any AFI product will be uh, functional safety uh, compliant. So um, we followed these uh, guidelines from the 26262, uh, having each packet having CRC32 to provide the arming distance of more than three. We have a message counter of eight bits. And we have a timeout monitoring to keep a keep a live function in the in the A5. So <clears throat> these are uh, measures that are required in order to argue high diagnostic coverage 
uh, for a communication bus. This is based on table D6 of the ISO, and um, it leaves the flexibility and the ability, uh, the ability of a system level uh, uh, definition to reach uh, uh, the ACL goal that they are ma managing. So either uh, uh, the, the full ACL or the specific ACL level, if it's ACL B or ACL D, uh, is determined by the, uh, the system level uh, uh, engineers or uh, uh, implementers based on uh, their uh, uh, goals and their definitions. And uh, if I will allow them to reach any of this, uh, it gives the, uh, the capabilities uh, for all of them. Okay, as, as we said, um, this is just to clarify, an A5 port is uh, considered a uh, form between the two uh, connectors, what we call TPA and TPB. Everything in the A5 is defined between these two points in order to have a very clear interoperability and testability uh, for this A5 uh, and make sure that uh, um, the the standard can fit an interoperable easily an interoper interoperable testing to allow different companies to generate a, a, and communicate together. We maintain the low baud rate, either two gig or four gig, not above that for up to 16 gigabit per second. And we have uh, the clock direction is always from the source to the to the sink. That's uh, uh, also, in order to simplify and help with the clear uh, definition of the spec of the solution. <clears throat> Just a clear uh, or very uh, simple overview of the uh, of the uh, state main state machine of the A5. So um, the again, in order for to simplify. It's going to be the same, or definition for the state machine is the same for the source and the sink. There is a possibility to transition either by internal mechanism or local host, or even by remote uh, messaging. All changes are reported to the local systems. And uh, some activities, we call it automatic, but it can be done internally uh, and do not require any external intervention moving from normal to, from startup to normal or from normal to sleep may occur independently by uh, internal decision of the, of the file. There is also defined a test mode. This is also in order to help with the capabilities supporting functional safety and also interoperability and testing. So <coughs> the file layer. So as we said, there are two profiles. One is doing NLZ and one is doing PAM, PAM 4, 8, and 6. It's PAM 4, 8, and 16. So in order to uh, simplify the overall uh, design, this is a, a, a joint or unified uh, design uh, supporting both. The uplink PMD is also based on 8-bit, 10-bit, so it can use the same PCS as the downlink uh, NRZ. This is true for all gears. And uh, from the link layer, there is the RTS sublayer, which is managing the data pacing and buffering of this of the data. It assigns the uh, the message counters and CRC. And for profile two, it handles the pre the retransmission retransmission process of a packets. Um, and I, I will go into details with that in, in a few slides. And the PCS layer, it's, uh, we have PCS 148-bit, 10-bit, and 14PAMX. And it specifies, of course, the conversion between the data link layer A packets after assigning the message counter and the CRC into five symbols. Uh, and in some, uh, in profile two, it's also handle some uh, something that we, we call JITC, which is uh, just-in-time counselors and retraining. And the, 
the PMD is, of course, the electrical specification for the physical medium. And you can see that the source and sink have basically the same structure and same build. So retransmission, RTS, is the time-bounded local file retransmission, level retransmission. It means that um, it, the retransmission is used to recover damage packets due to effect of large in-car electrical transient uh, with long burst of errors. It recovers damage packets due to instant attack, but that could not be canceled by a, a narrowband a, a cancellation, uh, which creates long burst of errors. It is, it's ensure steady link of throughput uh, to enable seamless higher layer, layer operation, even at extreme fire operation points. All of this is, as, as the last bullet said, it's seamless and it's uh, uh, transparent to the upper layers. <clears throat> just to, so, just to clarify, so what it means time bounded, it's retransmission is only attempted within predefined overall delay. For example, for gear five, it's only six micro. And the overall delay is the TX delay here and the interconnect delay and the RX delay. So this is the overall delay, and it's always uh, not, uh, not uh, uh, happening more than the predefined value. It's local, it's local. It's local. Uh, it means that the transparent to the upper layers and it happens only between these layers of the A5. Link layer to link layer or below that from RTS to RTS. So you don't, the upper layers, the protocol and the adaptation layer, the file do not see it. it and it happens in A5, one, in one hop of the A5. It is not being dra uh, uh, dragged into a, a uh, further hopes if the, in the case of the uh, daisy chain. So dynamically modulated, it means that retransmitted packets are as better error resistant in the payload uh, than the original uh, packets by using a lower sub-constellation, which means if we, we use it in a, st a stronger uh, immunity for specific ones. You, if you work with PAM 16, then the re retransmitted packet will be sent in PAM 8. So it has uh, better uh, noise immunity. As we said, it's highly reliable. It gives packet error rate of 10 by minus 19. And highly resilient because of this, the nature of it, it allows you to have long, uh, long error bursts to, to overcome long uh, error bursts and to support multiple uh, tens of millivolts uh, 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 pulses uh, in instant attack. And in addition, it gives you very low overhead that allow us to have 90% data rate, net data rate. So only ten, all this mechanism is only taking from the file and the link with the, uh, everything less than 10% of the overall a link rate. So, um, I'm, uh, so I'm, I'm heading to the end of this. So the link layer, the link layer is a, a it's a protocol agnostic layer that performs scheduling and prioritization. It actually the interface between the, the, the protocols adaptation layer and the file, it allows a, every, a, the flexibility of using multiple a, a MIPI or non-MIPI protocols like VISA if needed and the agreed and the, a, also low speed the interfaces like GPIOs and I2C. It has a single a, network uh, interface or multiple A5. So for example, if uh, there is a daisy chain uh, uh, structure as Ariel so showed, 
So data can come here and go into CSI here or being transferred via this uh, other port. And this is again several ways to use. You can, you can see what you can see is that actually in order to uh, In order to reduce the amount of uh, usage of bandwidth, for example, if you go from one source to multiple outputs, the multiplication occurs only on the last uh, only on the last uh, uh, hop. So the bandwidth is being uh, uh, being kept low lower than if you need to do that the whole way. So as I said, forwarding prioritization. It allows duplication of data and also scheduling. Um, this is just a very to show the API between the link layer and the PAL. This is a very simple, uh, straightforward interface, clock data and control, uh, very similar to uh, a subset of what is uh, currently uh, in the MIPI, uh, PPI interfaces for the, the legacy interfaces. Uh, so this is a, a, a level to enable easy migration, and also it allows for higher speeds in the next generation. And I really want to take this. Yeah, so the in-vehicle architecture is uh, uh, evolving uh, rapidly, as uh, I was explaining. Um, uh, we are having increased focus on surround sensor application uh, for ADAS and autonomous driving. And what is important for standardization is uh, the economy of scales, reusing of uh, proven protocol, uh, large ecosystem, and uh, to enable uh, lower cost and uh, greater capabilities. So um, basically, uh, the MEP protocol, which have been originally uh, designed for mobile and have been very popular there, uh, deliver an enormous benefit to the automotive industry because we are able to reuse this protocol that are further being developed uh, in MIPI to increase uh, more uh, advanced features there for camera displays and others and bring the benefit automatically to the automotive industry by connecting to the AFI. And uh, the solution of uh, MIPI A5 is being developed to meet the broader spectrum of the automotive industry need. Uh, so uh, looking at the requirement for multiple OEMs and uh, looking at different uh, uh, EMC requirements. Um, and this is how we uh, came to the A5 and we anticipate it to start to see it on the market uh, with SOP at around 2024. Thank you. So now we will be able to take some questions. Very good. Thanks, Ido. Thanks, Ariel. I do have some questions here that have come in on the Q&A panel. First one is, is FTP shielded twisted pair supported as well? Yes. OK, next question is. <laughs> Oh, answer. Yes, yes exactly. <laughs> yes. Okay. Next question: How much power and at what voltage can you realistically deliver over the interface? Um, I think it's uh, about. Uh, 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 Seventy-five ampere uh, on uh, seven. Or on eight volts. Uh, no, not a, it's zero seventy-five. Um, this is the maximum spec. Okay. Next question is: What is going to be the number of data lanes for a typical A5 port? One. It's uh, a five port uh, version 1.0 has only one data lane that can be either on a coax or on a shielded twisted pair or SDP 
a single differential pair. Okay. And next question, any plans to allow the sink to provide the clock? I believe GMSL offers this and it allows a minor cost reduction at the sensor. Um, there's nothing in the spec that prevents that. It has been considered, and uh, this is an implementation uh, uh, thing. Okay. Next question. Why SOP so late 2024? Well, we are now middle of 2020. Um, uh, the member company were waiting for the spec, uh, or actively waiting uh, by uh, contributing and to have the spec available, and then to finalize their design. And you know, in the automotive industry, uh, it takes some time until you can uh, qualify uh, a link, and especially you need to qualify from uh, all the EMC and uh, automotive environment, which take uh, quite a long time. So, yeah, 2024 is actually not so far in on that scale. Yeah, and there's nothing that prevents it earlier either. Um, yeah, yeah you know, that's right. <laughs> if others can implement it earlier, uh, we, we've been using that target uh, as was established, you know, based on the timeline that Ariel uh, referenced as well. So it's a sample, a sample uh, from a member company may come uh, much earlier than 2024 in order to make it available for uh, automotive uh, in production in 2024. This is obvious uh, because sometimes it's required for qualification. Okay, next question. Does eye diagrams have been defined for the various gears? Or does I diagrams have to be defined for the various gears? So, for uh, the for the gear one and two, there is uh, there are I diagrams. For the gear three to five, there are uh, uh, not I diagrams due to the uh, it's a pun, and there are other uh, means to define the. Uh, require the uh, receiver uh, uh, or the receiver uh, performance. So <clears throat> there are the, there are definition for all the gear uh, related to the transmission and the rece uh, receiving uh, ends. Thanks, Ido. Next question, will the expected startup time in the 100 to 200 MS range? Yes, the expected the startup time should be a confined to 100 milliseconds. Okay. And what is the coding for the PAM to make under 90% data efficiency? So the efficiency of 90% is maintained for all the PAM, all the all the gears from three to five, PAM four, PAM eight, and PAM sixteen. It's not uh, it's not coding dependent. Okay. I am mindful of the time. It's the top of the hour. I do see there's a few more questions and wonder if we can take a few more questions. Okay. Can you talk a little about the A5 packet header? CSI2 has an ECC field, whereas A5 is CRC. Is there error correction for the packet header or how does one detect errors? So, okay, <laughs> uh, good, good question. Um, so uh, uh, maybe uh, I, I show you we have the stack diagram um, where we introduce a provision for functional safety 
uh, at end to end. So this means that we have some uh, um, extension on, for the CSI2 and also for the GSI packet format, where we add uh, some additional things in the in the protocol, uh, additional uh, uh, fields uh, for uh, longer CRC like CRC32 and uh, additional message counter at the protocol level. Then in the AFI itself, uh, we also have it on the A packet, on the APPI interface, where we have a A packet header with a message counter and the header CRC, and also uh, there is a, a payload CRC32. So uh, the fact that the uh, original DeFi uh, has uh, uh, ECC, uh, in its uh, packet, uh, this is not preventing the AFI to have a, a additional uh, error detection mechanism. And when going to native uh, AFI uh, implementation, like uh, we see this is uh, going to come, um, uh, then there's no need at all to transport any ECC or, uh, I will say, uh, legacy packet header and uh, footer down. I just use the A5 uh, native mechanism. Okay, I'll take one more question, if that's okay. Would the combo adaptation layer be used for CSI2 as well as GPIO and I2C? Okay, so it's a uh, um, uh, it's uh, implementation can choose to use either separate uh, adaptation layer for GPIO for I square C or and CSI2, or to make them combo. There's nothing in the spec that uh, force implementers to use uh, separate or combo. So I think it depends on the actual uh, use case uh, that uh, each implementer has. Uh, to consider. Both are possible. Okay, well, thank you everyone for the questions. There are more coming in, although I'm mindful of the time. So, again, appreciate your attending, and we will make this available by the end of the day on the website in the Knowledge Center. Thanks, Ariel. Thanks, Ido, and thanks, Peter. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good day.